Facebook.com backslash Democrats or Democrats.org backslash Democrats live. We come to you every week talking about the hottest and most important issues facing our country. Democratic Party is not just for the Democrats, it's for all the American people. And so today we're going to be talking about the importance of fighting for health care, fighting for health care for all. And I first want to introduce a good friend of mine from the House of Representatives, Representative Joe Kennedy. Joe, how are you doing tonight? Keith, it's a pleasure, pal. Thanks yeah. for having me. Tell me a little, just about a few seconds about yourself, man. So, uh, represent the uh, 4th District of Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, kind of south and west, down to Rhode Island. I just started my third term, and um, thrilled to be here, thrilled to be your, your colleague, my friend. So thanks absolutely, for me. absolutely, man. And we're here also uh, with uh, Fatima. Fatima is with the Women's Law Center and knows quite a bit about the Affordable Health Care Act and is fighting every single day to help make sure Democrats can get some health care. Fatima, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, thanks for having me. I've been at the National Women's Law Center for 10 years, and I'm the incoming president there. Oh. Uh, our work- Let's here give a hand. Madam President. <laughs> You know, we worked hard to get the Affordable Care Act passed in the first place because we know what it means for women and, and their families, and we are deeply concerned about what's happening today. We're going to go into that deep. And also, a special person to me, Abby Shanfield, who uh, she and I worked together on the Hill. But more importantly, uh, Abby has said many times, and she's not afraid to say tonight, that the Affordable Care Act actually helped save her life. She's going to talk about her own story and what's really important to her about fighting. And before we dive in, let me just say, next week on Democrats Live, we're gonna have your own, Senator Elizabeth Warren. She'll be here. And uh, we want you to know that that'll be Tuesday, March 21st. You can get information on uh, uh, dnc.org backslash Democrats Live. First question up, you know, Joe, you were minding your own business. <laughs> and, uh, I tried to. Just tried trying to. to be just a regular kind of member of Congress, <laughs> doing your own job. And then you had a strong reaction to Speaker Paul Ryan when he said uh, that uh, the, the Republican bill was an act of mercy. Give us a little bit of background on that one. Look, if you know what this bill does, um, it strips health care from 24 million people. Um, it uh, strips access to essential benefits from 11 million people on the Medicaid expansion. It cuts close to a trillion dollars off of Medicaid. It transfers $600 billion from families working paycheck to paycheck to the wealthy in our country. Um, this bill is actually, if you look at the details of it, it's a tax cut wrapped up as health care and sold as health care. That's right. And to say that somehow that is an act of mercy, that for folks that need access to health care, that somehow this is going to make them better off. Health care, Keith, for me, as I try to think about it, comes down to the simple idea that health care is how we care for each other in their time of need. Mm -hmm. This bill makes it harder for, particularly for families that are working paycheck to paycheck, to get the care that they need when they need it. And so the idea that anyone could say that this is, one, a health care bill, but two, somehow meeting the needs of folks that are struggling, it does, now that particularly we have the data, it does exactly the opposite. And so trying to wrap it up as saying that the Republicans are doing something generous or meeting the needs of the American people by this bill, I do find insulting and I do take offense to. And I think um, they need to be called out on it. And I'm happy to see that a lot of people are. Well, Joe, you have a, um, a, a staffer in your office who has faced her own health care challenges. Um, it's personal for us. It's not just policy stuff, Look, huh? It's, it's personal for us, but this is the thing about health care, too. And, and it's obviously personal for, for my intern, who's I give uh, an awful lot of credit, and, and like Abby has had the courage to speak up and speak out about her own experience with it. 
But with healthcare, Keith, this is something that is going to touch every single one of us at some point. You That's might right. not need it now, but at some point you're going to. A loved one is going to. And that's why this is about it's about caring for each other but it's about hoping and celebrating the fact that i hope that when you or your loved one is ill that you get the care that you need and i hope that at some point when i or my loved one is ill that you would help ensure that they get the care that they need or that i need because at some point or another we are all going to need it that's right and so somehow saying hey you're on your own pull yourself by your uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you don't have boots and you don't have straps, how are you supposed to do that? That's right. And this bill basically just says, we're taking away everything you've got. We're stripping that safety net and saying we can't afford it and then giving the rich tax cut. That's not what healthcare is about. It's not. Fatima, lay it out for us. I mean, this bill is going to have a particular effect on women, uh, young women, elderly women. Can you lay it out a little bit for us? Yeah. In many ways, this bill is a big old penalty mm. on women. It uh, is a penalty on older people generally who are going to have to pay five times more than younger people. That's disproportionately women. Hmm. It's a big penalty on anyone who has a change of life circumstance and something happens. If you lose your job, if you miss a payment, you're going to have to pay a huge penalty. That is one of the really odd things about this piece of legislation. They say, oh, we've gotten rid of the mandate. It's okay. But then if you have a break in coverage, they hit you very hard. That 30%. money, well, and that money doesn't go to the government to help defray expenses. Who does it go to? Well, it's the, a, that's the thing. The insurance company. You start right? it with it, the, the insurance companies and also the massive tax cut that's in oh, yeah. this bill. So when you think about who is being hurt and who is being helped by this bill, I mean, it's it's outlined pretty clear. But it's also a penalty on the millions of women who are getting care right now in Planned Parenthood. Sure. It's an all-out assault on the ability to have basic things like cancer screenings, basic things like access to birth control. There's even a penalty in this bill for people who are trying to have abortion care. It goes out of its way to effectively make it so that private insurers can't really cover abortion. All of these things amount together to a big old penalty on women. And one more thing that I have to add because it's just so shocking. They even make it hard for people to get the tax credit. They make it so that married families have to file jointly. Mm -hmm. Well, what about people who are going through a divorce? What about domestic violence victims? Sure. What about someone who can't locate someone and you have to file jointly under the tax code in order to get this sort of tax credit. This is not a thing that works for women and their families. Well, you know, uh, Fatima, I think it's important to know for people who may not know all the contours of the bill that it just eliminates Planned Parenthood. That's in the bill. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's just straight that's up right. it gone. It just strips the funding. And that attack on Planned Parenthood, that's not a, just an attack on Planned Parenthood. That's an attack on the millions of people who are trying to get care, who have chosen Planned Parenthood as their provider. Screening, cervical cancer. And Joe? Keith, if you actually, during the midst of that 28-hour hearing we were in, you heard, the oh, yeah. <laughs> you heard the justification for it. It was, we're stripping money from Planned Parenthood because they provide abortion. As everybody knows, that money, federal dollars, can't be used to fund abortion. That's right. And, and the pushback from Republicans was then, yeah, but money's fungible, so because they do provide abortion services, we should strip it anyway, even though this isn't going for abortion. I did bring up the point and say, well, under that logic, are you going to defund every doctor that gets, any, or bar any federal payment to any doctor that might perform some sort of right. birth control services? Any hospital that might receive fe other federal funding and perform abortion services? Because if that's the logic under it, you're actually putting our entire health care system at risk. And there was no response to that. And look, the, the bottom line on this, you've heard a lot from our Republican colleagues saying, look, this is about choice and this is about freedom. For some reason, paying a tax under an individual mandate to the government was tyranny. Paying a penalty to a health insurance company is freedom. Yeah. And the only <laughs> choice that this provides, logic. the only mm -hmm. choice this provides is for working families to choose between paying your mortgage and paying for your medication. Because that's what this bill does. And that is something that our Republican colleagues are celebrating as choice and the restoration of freedom in our country. Well, Welcome uh, to the United States of America. My well, friend. you know, as ridiculous <laughs> as it was, I mean, uh, the chairman of the uh, Oversight Committee said you should have to pick between having a cell phone and your health care, which was a shocking moment. I think, uh, you know, I really, I said, wow, you know, you really just said it. People <laughs> got that choice to make. You know, um, we're talking policy here, and that's important, but let's, we got to talk about how this impacts people. Sure. Abby, do you mind sharing a little bit about your story right now? Absolutely. So, And by the way, I want to join Joe and say that you and 
uh, his intern, incredibly brave. This is your personal business. So thank you for sharing this. Can we hear it for Abby a little bit? Yeah. So I think all of that this is going on is, is very frightening, particularly for people like myself, but also I'm afraid not just for the coverage lost or the, the health consequences that I may experience if I ever pursue other avenues, go to grad school, I lose employer-based coverage, I go on another path and I, I can't find health care. I'm not just scared for myself. Like you were saying, Congressman, this, this impacts all of us. Mm -hmm. I'm scared for the millions of Medicaid recipients mm -hmm. who, who won't be able to access care or have their benefits cut or have enrollment caps eventually when per capita cap money runs out. Mm -hmm. I mean, those consequences are real. I, I know this because I was born with a very rare disease called toxoplasmosis. Um, the consequences of that are very severe. They range from organ failure to blindness to congenital hydrocephalus. I lost my vision when I was 17 in my left eye. I could lose the vision in my right eye. The only drug that treats my disease now costs $750 a pill. It's, it's Daraprim. Thanks to Mr. Scarelli. Mr. Mr. Scarelli and I are best friends, obviously. <laughs> um, so, so those consequences are real. My, my neurosurgeries cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Without health insurance, I mean, I could die. I could die or I could lose the vision in my other eye. I could have severe brain damage. But the consequences are, are very, very severe and dramatic for me. But they're often sort of more regular things too that can send people into bankruptcy and we'll go right back yeah. to it let me just say you guys we're lucky to have uh representative kennedy for the few minutes that we had him he has a pretty tough schedule tomorrow st patrick's day and he's in demand <laughs> he's in demand y'all so let's thank uh representative kennedy for joining us thank you. Thank you. Yeah. and uh with our little break let me just remind everybody you can go to dnc.org slash Democrats live. You can go there to check out what's going on with the Democratic Party, including donate. That's fine. And also volunteering. And so you were talking to us a little bit about what you were going through, what you were dealing with. Abs. Yeah, absolutely. I think that so my example is really dramatic and, and my future is really, really uncertain. Should I leave the congressman's office, which I don't want to do, but should, no should my path take me elsewhere if I can't afford health care? Sure. Currently, Republicans are saying they're going to protect people like me with really severe pre-existing conditions. Will that last? Who knows? But if I also can't afford health insurance, that's the same difference for someone like me. I, I seriously could have very, very grave consequences. But also somebody working at CVS part-time or working at Denny's who has arthritis, who all of a sudden can't afford health insurance. That puts a burden on people that is very, very, it's very hard to explain and communicate, but it's this deep fear and, and uncertainty and almost a feeling of being trapped. And like Congressman Kennedy said, we should be investing in people so we can help each other out, so we can thrive and flourish rather than trapping people in domestic violence situation, bankrupting people, sending people to early deaths if we're if we're being honest so i'm very scared and but i do believe that we can defeat this we can defeat it well how do how do we defeat it fatima what what is our methodology uh we don't have the white house we don't have the congress we 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 but but do we but are we without tools i don't know i think the people have the congress okay. and that is the thing to keep in mind you know, we've seen people pouring into town halls, pouring into the streets, and I just have to pause and tell you a story about a woman who called the Law Center. Please. You know, she has a child with a pre-existing condition, mm -hmm. so she is deeply worried about what's happening right now with this bill. And what she has been doing is every single day taking one minute to tweet a picture of her child. That's so awesome. to remind her congressperson what's at stake. So people are, they're making calls, they're taking more friends to make those calls with them. Sure. They're going in district meetings. I'm sure you're meeting with people all oh, the yeah, time. Lots of them. People will make their voices heard. And the truth about this bill, what's actually in this bill is gonna come out. So, you know, Abby, you, you not only have faced a serious illness, but you also work in a congressional office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are some of the things people can do? 
Right. I think Fatima touched on a lot of them. We really, I mean, we need people to show up like every day, call their member of Congress, have their friends call their member of Congress, particularly members that aren't friendly to the ACA or to Medicaid or to Medicare. And talk to your friends and neighbors about why the ACA, why Medicaid, why Medicare, why they're all connected and why they're all important. They're all important to each of us and we may not be in Medicaid, but we may have a friend with a disability or I know my parents are getting older and Medicaid pays for over half of nursing home care. Mm. I need Medicaid for my family just as much as somebody who is low income or who has a, like a family member with a disability. It's, it's something we all need, and so we need to talk to our friends and neighbors about why we need to show up every day, calling calling our members, calling our governors, and really urging people to get involved. So so do those politicians really listen to those calls and letters and I stuff? I think they do. <laughs> I think they do. What yeah. do you think, Congressman? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Fatima, you agree with this, that we should reach out to the people who represent us and tell them how we feel about this? That's what we are doing. That's what all of our supporters are doing. And that's what people want to do right now. So I, you know, I believe- Can I answer our studio? Order? What do y'all think? Should, should the people <laughs> rise up and raise their voices? Yeah. All right. They'll be heard. Y'all heard it. <laughs> Experts all. I'm sorry to interrupt, Fatima. No, what I was, what I was saying is that people aren't waiting they're showing up and showing up creatively. Oh, yeah. You're going to see all sorts of things that you haven't seen before. So people are showing up digitally. They're showing up in person. They're showing up on the weekends. This has become the new lunch. It's become the new brunch. People are showing up. Absolutely. Well, you know, uh, a lot of interesting things about uh, this, this rollout of this Republican bill. One is the CBO score. The, con the CBO is the Congressional Budget Office. Um, let me just ask you. Uh, Abby, is, is this uh, bill going to provide lower costs and more coverage? And uh, I mean, that's what was promised. That's what they told right. us, right? I mean, we should believe everything, right? We're yeah. here, right? No, absolutely not. That's not going to be the case. And Fatima can, I'm sure, talk more about this as well. But I mean, the reasons a lot of perhaps the initial sticker price is going to be lower is actually sort of an illusion because the reason that perhaps the initial sticker price is lower is because older people are simply just going to drop out of the market because they can't afford care. Like Fatima said before, it's going to go from a three to one to a five to one additional charge the older you get. And that's unsustainable. Now, so for people who don't quite know what that means, could you kind of lay that out a little yeah. bit clear, more clearly? So older people can be charged five times more than perhaps a healthy version of me, Wow, <laughs> which is a lot. Um, and so because the tax credits won't be as generous as what they are now, people simply won't, older people simply will just go uninsured. And I mean, that's a, that's a huge So problem. in other words, if part of your premium payment is to go to, to, cover, to, to cover everybody because the risk pool is spread out, we all pay in, we all can benefit, if you cut certain people out who need more health care, then uh, you might be able to reduce the cost to the individual premium payer because some people will simply not be included. Is that what you're saying? Right. Is that right, Fatima? It's right. I mean, that's why when the CBO came out and actually told us what was really in yep. this bill, we found out that really by next year, about 14 million people mm -hmm. would lose their health care. Right. Over a longer period, 24 million mm -hmm. people. We found out that people are going to have to pay more. They're going to have less support to make the and then and under Medicaid, there'd be fewer benefits. Sure. And so it, it the math doesn't work out for a plan that's mm -hmm. actually going to help people that's going to ensure that people are healthier and ensure that people don't have to make those hard choices between actually getting the care they need and paying their bills. It's sure. a ridiculous plan. Well, let me ask Adrian. Adrian, do we got any folks who want to join in the conversation? What do you think? We do. We have so many folks tuning in tonight, and we're so excited to have you. If you've decided that you want to submit a question but you're having trouble, uh, it's not dnc.org. It's uh, democrats.org. Bad on me. Democrats <laughs> live. <laughs> Uh, but we oh, are so right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, take out that bad note that I wrote. Yeah, thanks for that correction. I said I, it is Democrats.org, Democrats Live, right? Yep. All right. So tune in. We want you guys to be involved, and uh, we do have a few questions from our studio audience, right? We do, and we have a lot of submissions. It's a complicated topic. We had a lot of questions from Twitter. 
Um, they're all focused on healthcare. So to start, uh, Dre asked, will kids still be covered up to age 26 under my employer healthcare? Asking about his own kids. You guys wanna tackle that one? As of now, yeah, under the current GOP plan that the House is discussing, that is correct. You know, it's interesting. I actually ran into somebody who was upset because under the Affordable Care Act, the bill that Obama signed, Obama signed into law, they were annoyed because they said, you know what? Obama's making it so my kid has to get off health care at the age of 26. <laughs> and I was like, Obama made it possible for your kid to stay on until they were 26. There is a lot of misinformation and about that. Phase two and three that he was right. exactly exactly right. We got to right. watch right. out for phase two and three. Yeah. Well, let's talk about phase two and three. I mean, Fatima, do you want to? Well, take some of that? a big thing of it is because the math doesn't work mm -hmm. in in their plans. There are a number of key things in the Affordable Care Act that we don't know what their plan really right. is. We don't know if they're going to bring back the battle days where they mm -hmm. charge women more just for being women. So being a woman was a pre-existing condition under the old regime. That's right, that's yeah. right. They charge women more just for being women. And if women had things like C-sections, mm -hmm. even getting care for uh, domestic violence, for sexual assault, that was a reason to deny coverage altogether. Mm -hmm. Maternity care in your marathon hearing, I was shocked to see someone bringing back and raising the question of why do we even have maternity coverage in these plans? Well, men have prostates, women don't, right? <laughs> Last I heard, is my biology right? I mean, the fact is, is that we all pay because we all need care sometimes. And it doesn't matter whether you have a uterus and can have a baby or whether you have a prostate or who you are, we cover each other in a caring society. Mm -hmm. And so this is the idea behind a health care system. And, in a, side, and it's a society that has decided that it's not going to discriminate against right. women in health care as a matter of course. Right. As a matter so, of course. So these sort of basic, essential, preventative services mm -hmm. that make people healthier, you know, we've gotten used to those over the last yeah. few years. Right. They are not guaranteed in phase two mm -hmm. or phase three that has yet to be unveiled. Well, let's talk seniors for a minute. What happens to some of those preventative uh, things that were free? Are those going to be around? Hmm. Um, screenings it, and so forth? It depends upon what phase two and phase three look like, what they can get away with, what what their their actual plan is. We're not, like Fatima said, we're not clear. But if if what they have done in the Medicaid mm -hmm. part of the law is any indication, Amen. we should all be deeply concerned. Amen. Where they've been cutting benefits, where they've been making it harder to get care. All of that should have us extremely mm -hmm. worried about the Medicaid program and the people who are on that program but about what their plan actually is for the whole program. So any other questions we got, so Adrian? Building off that, what can be done to preserve access to care for lower income women if Planned Parenthood loses its funding? Fatima, you wanna hit that? The deeply concerning thing about this effort to strip Planned Parenthood from funding is providers have said that they right. cannot fill that gap. Planned Parenthood is serving millions of people and there aren't places that are just spotting up ready mm -hmm. to take in all of these people who get regular preventative services, cancer screenings, STD screenings, birth control. So it's deeply worrying if they actually are able to succeed in this all out attack on Planned Parenthood. Actually, we've met like community health centers in your sure. district have come in and the, the Republican talking point has often been, oh, community health centers, they'll pick up the slack. It'll be no big deal. But I mean, I know for a fact that community health centers have come in and be like, uh, we, we can't actually pick Cover up the that. slack. So if Planned Parenthood services go, we, there's not going to be anywhere for women to go. We can only take a fraction of what Planned Parenthood takes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I find disturbing about this, this as well is that it does represent uh, a tax transfer uh, from uh, low-income people to tax cuts for the wealthy. Like, our, there's a statistic out there that the top 1% will get 40% of the tax cut gains uh, based on the repeal and the, re and the replace. I mean, how does that strike you as uh, in terms of Trump's own supporters? I mean, the people who voted for him. Do they vote for themselves to uh, have less coverage and uh, tax cuts for the rich? It seems like the opposite of the promises that we've heard over the last year. You know, we've been calling this a wealth bill rather than a health bill because mm -hmm. the whole thing is structured to give these tax cuts uh, to, to people who don't need them. But absolutely, people should be 
extremely disappointed about the plans that they've seen rolled out, plans that go after low-income families, that make it harder to get the care they need, that put states in this terrible bind where they're going to have to be cutting people. Yeah. So does, uh, any, any other questions? Yeah. So uh, Betty asked, and we got this question a lot, how do Democrats propose to deal with existing problems with the ACA? Do we have our own proposals to deal with those? Well, let me, let me address that. We, we do have a number of proposals to deal with existing problems with the uh, Affordable Care Act. But the problem is we have not been in the majority and we have not gotten any cooperation from Republicans. They have always just said we own, they want to repeal it. I have had to suffer through 60 attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And yet they even, they even shut the government down 16 days because we refused to agree to repeal the Affordable Care Act. 16 days of shutting down government services over this issue. And yet, um, you know, uh, the question is, how, how, do we, how do we go forward with legitimate uh, am amendments and improvements? Well, it's very hard to do because they will not agree. And we don't have such an overwhelming majority. We, ne we have not had one since 2010. Uh, in order to make what I agree are legit improvements. I'd like to see us move more toward Medicare for all. I'd like to see us have regional exchanges to expand the pool. I'd like to see us allow Medicare Part D negotiate drug prices. I'd like to see, there are things that I think would, could be better, but uh, we haven't had any cooperative spirit among Republicans. Y'all want to weigh in on this? Well, the only thing I'd add is that the speed in which this uh, policy has been rolled out mm -hmm. and the way in which um, you w haven't had the sort of process that you'd like to oh, see boy. with public input. There are a lot of people around the country who would like to be heard about what it is they would like to see in health care. Well, I understand that we, Democrats, we had like 79 hearings on it we, from three different committees. We took all <laughs> types of comment. We took place over the course of a year that we debated and discussed this bill. And yet, um, these guys t have not had any hearings. Today was the first public hearing on the bill, and it wasn't really a true congressional hearing because it was the House Democrats who said, well, you know, if they won't have a hearing, we're going to have a hearing. And we had some experts from uh, the former uh, head of the CBO, Doug Elmendorf. We had uh, uh, Mr. Slavitt, who was with CMS. Uh, and we had a another witness who, uh, who I can't recall now. But the fact is, is that they haven't had any hearings at all. They don't want to discuss this. They don't want to hear from the American people. This is the least democratic process uh, on a, such a major issue that we that we have, that I've ever seen. So let's uh, let's get more folks in the conversation. What else we got today? So the last question: How will we communicate democratic solutions to people, and especially to the Trump base? How do we reach them? Democrats live, <laughs> listen in, <laughs> tune in. We'll, next week we'll be talking to Elizabeth Warren. But tonight we're talking with some awesome folks. We had Joe Kennedy with us. We have uh, Fatima from the Women's Law Center, and we got Abby from uh, the Hill. And we're talking to folks about the key issues. But the real, th the real issue is we've got to communicate, communicate, communicate. You guys want to weigh in on this issue? How do we get the word out to people about how they can get involved in this fight for health care, for dignity? Well, I just wanted to mention a campaign the National Women's Law Center has just launched called We the Resistance. Sure. It's a space and a place for people to come and find information about the health care law, about a range of policies that people care about, and we tell you how to take action. We tell you how to call Congress, how to get involved, and uh, so if you go to our website, nwlc.org, you'll find out more. But we want to help people engage in this moment. People are ready nwlc.org good idea check it out get good information there abby how do people get involved i think there's a lot of ways i think that what's really awesome about this is that this work has been going on for a long while before the aca people were fighting for improved medicaid coverage for more affordable health options so there's just tons of resources at the state and local level which also is so much easier to engage on and you can use Google and call folks like the National Women's Law Center who may be able to connect you with people at the state and local level. And, and also really starting your own conversations with your community, with your friends and neighbors. I think that what's really powerful about this is the American people want more affordable drug costs. Right. They want lower out-of-pocket costs, like things, the amount of money they have to pay to get care. They want it to be lower. And we can achieve that. 
and we just need to have the American people front and center every day and that is that is definitely doable and it's already happening. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, being here for another edition of Democrats Live. And, uh, you know, and I tell you, we'll be back every week talking to you about the issues that we care about most as Americans. The Democrat Party cares about people. We care about people's health care. We care about women's care. We care about people who are fighting every day to put food on the table. And we'll be here talking about these critical issues with you. Uh, so you can go to Facebook.com backslash Democrats or Democrats.org backslash Democrats Live. Next week, don't forget, tune in to check out uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. She will be here with us. We're quite excited about that. That's on March 21st, and you can tune in. And look, everybody, things won't get better unless you get involved. Don't ask yourself, why doesn't somebody do something about it? You do something about it. Get involved. Get involved now. There's a lot of ways you can get involved with us, Democrats.org backslash Democrats live where you can volunteer, you can support our efforts, and we can change this thing right around. So we'll see you next week, and we want to thank everybody uh, for joining in. Thank Joe, thank Abby, thank Fatima, thank Adrian, and all of you. We'll be back next week with Elizabeth Warren. Thank you, Democrats Live.